Hi all, it's time to start a new chapter today. We have chapter two on chemistry from our textbook. And so we're gonna be taking a look into chemistry simply because this subject is used as a tool to understand microbiology in a deeper sort of way. Uh, we need it, uh, it's not chem class, but even if you haven't had a chem class, I'm gonna teach this subject as if you have not had chemistry before. So we're gonna start from the ground up. We're gonna learn some basics about chemistry and then eventually talk about biochemistry and how that's gonna be essential in understanding microbiology at the level that we need to in this course. Before we do that, let's take a look at the syllabus and then we'll start in on chemistry. To remind everyone, we're in our second week and we're actually on the September 1st uh, presentation. However, September 1st says that we're still finishing up chapter one. I'm a little ahead of schedule at the moment, and I think that'll even itself out. So try not to worry about the fact that we're starting chemistry just a day earlier. And um, so that's where we're at right now. We're just starting in on chemistry. We finished nomenclature and history, introduction chapter one. Okay, so we're all set. And let's begin. There's a chapter opening question that says that a salmonella bacterium releases a regulatory molecule containing amino acids and phosphate that causes a human cell cytoskeleton to change shape, thereby allowing the bacterium to enter a cell. What type of chemical is this regulatory molecule? This may appear to be something that's just a drawing, like a computerized image, but this is an actual salmonella bacterium magnified millions of times by an electron microscope. And this electron microscope capture was then colorized so that we can see it more easily. Um, so the, the colors are false, but the picture is real. And this is a scary reality that occurs inside of the GI tract cells when a person contracts salmonella, especially with people who are immunocompromised and there's increased levels of invasion like we're seeing in this picture that does damage to cells. The damage can be expensive enough to actually cause bleeding in the intestines, so sometimes people have bloody stool. And if there's bleeding in the intestines, sometimes that actually causes the bacteria to get into the blood and people can go septic. And Last stats that I read, there are still about roughly 2,000 Americans each year that die of salmonellosis due to the disease process caused by the picture that you're seeing here. And so we're gonna get back to answering this question during our Zoom sessions, and I want you to keep it in mind as we go through some of the topic material here, and we'll see that we can readily answer this question in just a little while. Okay, we're gonna start in looking at chemistry at its most basic level. How, what is matter? How are um, atoms structured? How are molecules built from those atoms? And so forth. So chemistry will be the study of this as a subject. Atoms are gonna be considered the smallest units of matter. And we'll look at the basics like protons, electrons, neutrons, and such. We will not be diving as deeply into it as to talk about quantum chemistry and uh, even smaller subatomic particles like gluons and zeptons and you name it. Uh, we're gonna basically just stick with the stuff that you would learn in basic chemistry in that regard. And so that atoms will make molecules as we grow from the basic units into larger structures. And we'll just quickly review what are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Um, so everybody's on the same page. This is review, great for you, glad to hear that. And so you, this part might be a little bit easier for students who have had chem or can remember back to high school chemistry, if you had chemistry in high school. And we're gonna say three things about each one of these subatomic particles. Starting with protons, we can talk about their, uh, their location. So where are they located? Uh, if we look inside of a drawing here, 
we'll see that protons are located in the center, and the center of an atom is referred to as a nucleus. And so we have the protons in a nucleus. And if you could take a proton out of its nuclear location and put it onto a scale, it would have to be a scale like we've never seen before. Uh, there are no scales delicate enough to measure the weight of one proton, but because we still have to think about the weight of what a proton is, it's given a weight of one atomic unit. Uh, whatever that would be, it's one atomic unit, rather than talking about grams or some other uh, form of unit of measurement. So they weigh one atomic unit. And you can abbreviate atomic units as AU. Uh, we can talk about charge as well. So the third thing that we'll address for each of these is whether or not there's a charge present in protons. If anybody knows, have a positive charge. Let's compare neutrons to protons. We know that when we look at this drawing of an atom, that the nucleus has, appears to have two different types of members that make up the nuclear structure. So if there are protons in here that maybe are light green, we can see that their counterparts that they combine with are the neutrons. Perhaps we'll say that's in dark green. So neutrons are also located in the nucleus. And if we could put them on a scale, they will be counted as having the same amount of weight, which is one atomic unit. And neutrons, as their name implies, lack charge. So no positive charge, no negative charge, they are neutral. or lack charge. And then, finally, we have electrons. So if we look ahead one slide at the drawing of a basic atom, the electrons are located outside the nucleus. They are located in what are called orbitals, or energy shells that contain these orbitals where the electrons are shooting around at practically light speed as they orbit. And so we'll say that when it comes to their, uh, their location, they're outside the nucleus first. And if you could take an electron and put it on a scale, even some sort of fantasy scale where we talk about atomic units rather than actual grams, we would find out that the, or we would observe that the electrons don't have a weight that we're going to take into account. In theory, they must have some amount of actual weight, but it's so minuscule that we're going to go ahead and ignore that and say no significant weight. So for the purposes of basic chemistry, general chemistry, and of course like microbiology, the, weight, the actual weight of electrons does not affect our calculations or come into concern. So we'll count it as zero. And then maybe some of you might be able to guess, or you already may have heard, if protons have a positive charge, and our neutrons have no charge, the other end of the spectrum will be the electrons, which have a charge of minus one. So each electron counts as one negative charge, just like each proton counts as a plus one. These guys have negative charge, minus one. Okay, 
moving forward. This shows us our structure of the atom. And I don't think I need to say any more about that. Let's move forward to um, some other definitions. Basic definitions such as atomic number. The number of protons in an atom is defined as the atomic number. It's also the number that we see on the periodic table. So we'll find a slide in our lecture here that shows the periodic table of elements. All the different types of matter or elements in the universe as we know it comes with a number. Like hydrogen, for instance, would have an atomic number of one because it has just one proton in it. So keep that in mind. The mass number, however, takes into account not only the number of protons, but the neutrons as well. So weighing those atomic units gives us, together, gives us the mass number. And then we have the so-called atomic symbol. So if we were talking about hydrogen, as I was mentioning, that would have a letter H on the periodic table, just to abbreviate for hydrogen. Uh, helium also has, starts with an H, but then you would have to add an E to clarify HE for helium rather than just, just H for hydrogen. And then we have isotopes. Isotopes become interesting in that it's still the same type of matter, but then what might be occurring is that more neutrons are added to the element. So if you had hydrogen, which usually has only one proton, imagine that then if you put in a neutron. Now its weight would change, it would be a different isotope, but if it has a weight of two, instead of just one for one proton, you add the neutron, you get two, that would be called deuterium. Uh, we don't need to memorize deuterium in this course, but the point is, is that if you add in another neutron, or maybe even uh, another neutron on top of that, then it would be two neutrons and one, one um, proton. That would be tritium, because referring to the number three, tritritium. Um, and so these are just different isotopes. Here's an example, just to make sure you understand this concept, working with oxygen. So oxygen, Typically, the vast majority has a, an, a mass number of 16. So uh, the 8 that's down here next to the letter O for oxygen refers to how many protons there are. And then if there is an, uh, a mass number of 16 and you were to subtract off the protons that are referred to here as the atomic number 8, then 16 minus 8 would give you 8 neutrons left over because we don't take into account the electrons. Now, I'll go ahead and label this. Here is your number of protons called the atomic number. Right, number of protons. And then here, the 16 is the mass number. the protons plus the neutrons. Just abbreviating there. So if this is what's referred to as oxygen 16 based on its mass number or its approximate total weight, uh, then we have an oxygen 17 and we have an oxygen 18. Keep in mind, isotopes must always contain the same number of protons because if you change the number of protons, like if you put a 9 here, it's no longer oxygen. It becomes a different element, and we don't want that. Um, if, if that happens, it's no longer an isotope. You just change the, what the element is. So when we say oxygen 17, it doesn't differ by the number of protons. It differs by the number of, you guessed it, neutrons. So 17 minus 8 would give us that there are 9 neutrons in this case. And for that matter, just a quick question for yourselves, how many neutrons would oxygen 18 have? So easy enough to figure out. We can always review that if anybody has any questions. Okay. Chemical elements, um, just understanding a few more basic rules about them. 
atoms can gain or lose electrons. Atoms can lose excess neutrons, so we get different isotopes in that case. Uh, gain or loss of electrons can change the total charge of the elements or the molecules that are involved, but they never gain or lose protons. Otherwise, you have a different element, as I was mentioning. All right, here's a table taken from your textbook, and it's here for reference. You don't have to memorize it. However, I think that it's a good reference because these are the common, some of the common elements that are found inside of living systems. So over time, you'll have them memorized just because you work with them often enough that it becomes second nature to know some of these various numbers. Like hydrogen has an atomic number of one because of the one proton. Uh, but then we can talk about carbon. Carbon always has six protons, but it also has six neutrons, so that it has an approximate weight of 12. So we talk a lot about carbon 12 because that's the vast majority of carbon in the universe. But later on in the course, we'll talk about how carbon 13 can be used in the microbiology classroom or in laboratories and in medical applications. Uh, we can talk about carbon 14, which is used in radiocarbon dating for looking at the age of fossils and the relative age of um, decaying, well, dead matter um, that decays over time. Uh, we can talk about nitrogen, oxygen. We'll use this as a reference, and we'll come back to that. Okay, electronic configurations. So looking just a little bit more closely at how the protons, neutrons, and electrons are situated, especially the electrons themselves when it comes to energy levels. Uh, realize that on the periodic table that we'll be uh, looking more closely at, all the elements start out as having no charge. So if we're talking about the element hydrogen, there's one proton, as we know, but there's then one electron. One proton has one positive charge, and to balance that out, there has to be one electron having a minus one charge, and the two will then give a neutrally presented element. So the elements appear on the table, charge neutral, but in reality, when these elements are out floating around in most environments, we will see that sometimes extra electrons get gained or sometimes they're lost and we'll try to, we'll try to understand the predictions of when these um, electronic configurations get rearranged. And that's important so that we understand why molecules combine or sometimes how molecules break apart. As bonds are broken or formed, these electronic configurations will change. But initially they started out, they start out just like here with carbon as an example. Carbon has six protons, but let's take a closer look at the six corresponding electrons that have to be situated around the carbon nucleus. So there are two energy shells pictured here, and the way that energy shells work is that they fill up by holding a maximum number of electrons, and we start with the first energy shell being closest to the nucleus. So the first energy shell um, has two electrons that occupy it, and then that energy shell is full. So we know that with hydrogen, there only is, there's only one energy shell needed because it only comes with one electron. They can accept an extra, extra electron, but when you start looking at larger elements like carbon, there definitely has to be more than just the first energy shell. We have four more electrons to go, and the way that carbon is configured initially is that the other four electrons that carbon has are situated in the second energy shell. When it comes to the second energy shell, the laws of physics dictate that up to eight electrons can be packed into that second energy shell to fill it up. So we refer to this second energy shell and even the third energy shell, which has the same rule, a maximum of eight electrons can occupy the second and third energy shells as the so-called octet rule. So the octet rule is that eight electrons will fill up the most commonly occupied second and third energy shells in most living molecules. Uh, the abundance of elements, besides um, simple things like hydrogen, uh, usually have um, at least a second and or, or even a third energy shell. And up to eight electrons can fill 
those shots. Electrons fill the second and third energy shells. The first shell has two. write that note about the octet rule. You'll hear it mentioned by your chemistry teachers as well. Okay. And so moving forward, we have some other uh, configurations of atoms taken from your textbook. So just for reference, we can see the diagram of nitrogen, and we can see oxygen and magnesium as well. And so when we look at uh, an element like magnesium, it's a bit more complex in that it has its first and second energy shells completely occupied or filled, and then there's a third energy shell that then starts to have some electrons that are present in, the, in that outermost energy shell, the third one. Now, whether you're talking about magnesium's third outermost shell, or we're talking about oxygen's second outermost shell, this outermost shell is referred to as a valence. And so a valence is the number of, uh, it, it's the outermost shell, but we can also talk about the valence as being how many electrons are um, missing or are extra in that shell based mostly on the octet rule if we're talking about second and third energy shells. So let's go back and look at valence a little more specifically. In oxygen's valence, its second shell is missing two electrons. So oxygen only has to gain two more electrons to fill up and fully stabilize its outermost valence or energy shell. And so we can say that um, Oxygen has a, a valence of minus two. It needs to gain two electrons in order to meet its, um, its needs as to fill its valence or meet the octet rule. Uh, we can say that magnesium has a valence of plus two. It has two extra electrons that it would most likely seek to get rid of. Um, it's much more convenient for magnesium to just give away those two electrons perhaps then to go and find six more electrons to gain in order for magnesium to fully fill that energy shell, it's more likely going to get rid of those two electrons, give them away to some other uh, situation in the environment, and then magnesium, if it gives away two electrons, then how many negative charges has it given away? Remember, every electron has a minus one charge. So if magnesium gives away two electrons, it's lost two char negative charges, but it still has the same number of protons. So if you remember back to your chemistry class, or if you've never had it, you'll notice that in chemistry, magnesium is almost often written as Mg plus two, because those electrons escape very easily into the environment. And so a common way to write magnesium is Mg plus two after this electron and this electron end up going away. So that the, that the uh, so that this atom can stabilize itself easily. All right, that's just an example of showing how um, valences can behave. So let's look at the rules a little more closely. 
the number of electrons in the valence will affect the behavior of the atom. So magnesium behaves as an electron donor in almost all cases. We can say that oxygen, on the other hand, really wants to get, desperately wants to get a couple of extra electrons, so it's what's called electronegative. Um, this is a term that means that it attracts electrons towards it so that it can get those extra couple of electrons. Oxygen is sometimes written with a minus two because it will gain a couple of extra electrons, most likely, and then it's, well, it's inherited, or it will take onto itself those extra minus charges um, in most cases. So we can also predict than the behavior based on what's more convenient, giving away electrons or, you know, to, to stabilize a valence or gaining electrons to stabilize a valence. And when valences have stabilized, because you're talking about the first shell having two electrons total, or you're talking about the second and third shells meeting the octet rule, because they're filled, then we can say that they become stable and unreactive. So the atom is unstable and reactive when the valences are incomplete, but when they do finally rearrange to a complete status, um, they're gonna be less or non-reactive. Um, so keep that in mind, guys. That's as far as we're gonna need to go with energy shells. We're not gonna worry about a fourth or fifth or any energy shells in that category or beyond. Not for this class, so uh, we'll take it, we'll, we'll leave it there. Now when we talk about chemical bonds, we were talking about a rearrangement of those energy shells or electronic configuration. So atoms join through these uh, arrangements of rearrangements of valence electrons. We can say that they can either gain, lose, or share electrons depending on the types of bonds that form. And we're going to go over all three types of chemical bonds based on these events where electrons are gained lost or shared. So let's um, also, well, let's first look at ionic bonds. So we're going to take this in order. Ionic refers to ions, and so an ion has to be understood as an atom that has a charge, or a molecule that has a charge. So whenever you see a charge, like a minus sign, could be minus one, minus two, minus three, etc., or a plus sign, plus one, plus two, plus three, and beyond those positive or negative uh, charge denotations, they refer to an ion, all right? So what we need to understand about ions is that the opposite charges attract. So negative and positive charges will want to join with one another. And the reverse of that would be that like charges will repel. So if you have two positive charges they're going to repel each other to uh, like negative charges, same thing, they're going to repel each other, but opposite charges attract. And so let's take a look. This is the classic. Everybody knows uh, if they take chemistry at any level, um, the, you know, the beginnings, that table salt is most commonly uh, present as, a, you know, sea salt, table salt. This is sodium chloride as an example then of an ionic bond forming. And what happens is, is that if you look at the periodic table, uh, you see that sodium is on the far left of the periodic table with the number 11. Um, the number 11 refers to the number of protons that makes sodium sodium, but then those 11 positive charges on the periodic table has to be neutral as it's presented. We'll then have 11 minus charges to balance it out. So how would 11 electrons be rearranged around sodium? We have the first two in the first energy shell, then the second energy shell is full with meeting the octet rule, so two plus eight, that's 10, and then there's just one more electron, in the, and it's just sitting there alone in the, in the third energy shell called it valence, and so sodium's valence is, that valence electron's going to want to just leave so that uh, sodium can stabilize itself. And if sodium, loses that negatively charged electron, it now lost a minus charge. And if it loses a minus charge, but still has all of its protons that makes it sodium, then it's gonna have an extra proton 
Um, and so sodium will be written as a plus one at that point. So you'll see sodium written Na plus. Na, by the way, is strange. We think like maybe S for sodium, but we already use S for sulfur. And so instead of naming sodium an English name, it, I believe it's Latin, Na stands for natrium. Uh, natrium is just Latin for salt, for sodium. And so sodium um, is written Na plus, and then let's look at chlorine. Uh, chlorine has an atomic number of 17. So it has 17 protons, and therefore it comes initially with 17 negatively charged electrons. So when we look at that, we have two in the center, eight in the second energy shell, so there's 10, and then seven left over. It's one electron short of meeting its octet rule in its third outer shell, which is its valence. And so it just needs one lone electron, and nothing's usually more convenient than if it can run into a sodium that has an electron that it can just say, thank you very much. I'm now gonna meet my octet rule in the third energy shell. And so chlorine is then referred to as chloride. The chloride ion is, is always written Cl minus because it has that extra electron, so it's stable. And it has one more electron than it does protons, so 18 electrons and uh, 17 protons. And there you have it. So when we get this negatively charged chloride ion, and it's in an environment near a positively charged sodium ion, these two things together will make sodium chloride. So we get, uh, this, this would form what's called an ionic bond. Um, ionic bonds um, are pretty strong in some sense, but then when you put them into water, um, surprisingly, they're, however strong they are, they can start to dissolve, right? We see salt dissolve when we put it into water, and, um, and so we'll see that ionic bonds have a strength about them, but that strength can break down fairly easily when we consider water containing environments like we see inside of living systems. Okay, so speaking of um, sodium and chloride or other similar salts breaking down, um, living systems use those ions um, and we specifically refer to those ions as so-called electrolytes. Um, you may have heard this term, even in everyday life, uh, just I'm thinking back to like a television commercial, say Gatorade or Pedialyte, where um, they'll talk about how it hydrates better than just plain water alone because it contains valuable electrolytes which are good for your body's uh, muscle physiology and for the inner workings of cells beyond just straight water. And what it is is basically it's water with some amount of salt added to it. And the salt is dissolved in there and we say that those salts act, act as electrolytes. So th let's put a little working definition here for electrolytes. Electrolytes are ions usually from salt, various salts. It doesn't have to just be sodium chloride, but there are various salts as we'll learn about that participate in biochemical reactions And this term participate can be replaced by maybe even saying required. Um, if you're short on electrolytes and you don't have enough of them, then you can get muscle cramps. Say you're working out, and so then that's why sometimes people will recommend a liquid like Gatorade. Or we could talk about maybe a young child could use Pedialyte, or really anybody could, if maybe you're having sickness where diarrhea is occurring. So, if a whole bunch of 
liquid is coming out of your body in rapid amounts, then that person can become quickly dehydrated. And one of the battles with dehydration isn't just the loss of water, it could also be a loss of electrolytes. And in those cases, um, we, need, we would need to replace those um, you know, as we can so that the person can maintain a good balance. And so um, electrolytes are a part of this subject here of understanding you know, where they come from, from ionically, uh, from ionic compounds, okay? We can also say with predicting whether or not electrons are gained or lost, how many valence electrons are present. So if it's just a few, then those valence electrons are likely to leave. If there are almost eight, then a few more electrons are likely to be gained. Uh, and then that way, um, the octet rule can be met um, and stabilization can occur. So this is just showing sodium chloride forming. We can see how the bonds are represented here uh, between sodium and chloride ions. Uh, the, the bond forms to make uh, the ionic bond pictured here. All right, that's enough about that. How about let's look at uh, covalent bonds. So co, the way to think about it or to remember it is that co means to share. So covalent, if you're sharing a valence with a neighboring atom, then you get a covalent bond where electrons are not really completely given up or completely gained, but actually shared. So this is a very strong bond. This is, can, we're going to consider the covalent bond to be the strongest of all of the bonds that are described. And that's because when electrons are shared, uh, neither atom wants to give, give up that, those electrons that they share, and it's very difficult to break that apart um, when compared to other bond types. So hydrogen and hydrogen, when, when that gas has a whole bunch of itself all neighboring um, what happens is, is it's written as H2. And maybe you've seen that before if you've had some chemistry, is that we usually write hydrogen as H2. And that's because it wants to pair up. Oxygen does the same thing uh, where it's written O2. And that's because oxygen, remember we were talking about the two valence electrons that are missing. They can share with one another. And this is showing a single covalent bond where it's written H-H. Anytime you see the little line between two atoms or two molecules, it's written with a dash. And, and if it's a solid dash, it's, that's notation for representing a covalent bond. Um, if you were talking about oxygen, for instance, uh, the O2 molecule is, has two double bonds in between it. So we could look at it as two solid dashes, O2, for example. So you can have single covalent bonds like H2. You can have double covalent bonds like O2. You can even have triple covalent bonds. Uh, I, to my knowledge, there is no quadruple covalent bond, no quad covalent bond, but you can have uh, triple covalent bonds. And every time you add a covalent bond, you can get a stronger structure. Uh, in living systems, we don't really see triple covalent bonds, but we do see a lot of single and double covalent bonds. And so double is stronger than single, and you can, you know, it's pretty intuitive to see that. Uh, we can talk about how it doesn't always have to be atoms that are alike. So H2 and O2 are the same kind of atoms combining, but we can talk about differing atoms. So carbon, for instance, um, if you remember back a few slides, it has six valence electrons and, uh, I'm sorry, not six, four valent, valence electrons, six electrons total, but one, two, three, four, in order to get the octet rule met, it could gain four more electrons. And the, one of the easiest ways to do that is to borrow, uh, to share with hydrogens. And so if one carbon combines with four hydrogens, which have their little lone electron that they can take on and share, then we get a molecule of CH4 known as methane gas. So uh, that's natural gas. We talk about natural gas, whether it comes out of the earth or it comes out when animals pass gas. Um, methane, CH4, 
can be represented in this variety of ways. We can look at the molecular formula, CH4. We can look at the drawing showing specifically where the electrons, the electron pairs are shared. And by the way, that's another important point, guys. These are referred to as um, paired electrons. The way that electrons are shared together is um, pair sharing. So uh, they're written as doublets next to each other. Um, this is the most accurate way to think about it um, in, as far as molecular structure goes. Okay. Uh, this is just a drawing outlining what I had said a couple slides ago. You can have neighboring atoms. They don't have to be the same, but oftentimes they are. This could be an example of, say, two carbon atoms neighboring and then a shared pair of electrons. You could have two carbons neighboring um, rather than with a single shared pair of electrons. They could have two um, sets of shared electrons. And so they would be annotated like C. I don't know if these are carbons. I'm just saying commonly. You could have C dash C like that. Or you could have C double bond C like this. Uh, you could even have a C triple bond C, but not really in living systems. Um, C triple bond C would just have a couple of hydrogens on it to fill up the whole, uh, the carbon's whole valence, and um, those would be called alkynes. Uh, we don't really see alkynes so much um, because, well, that would be like rocket fuel or something. Um, and so we don't see that in living systems, um, but we might see this or that as uh, we move forward, we will. Okay. Now, the third type of bonding are hydrogen bonds. And so let's compare how hydrogen bonds are different than ionic and covalent bonds. Uh, hydrogen bonds are actually the weakest type of bonding. So we say they have a weak attraction um, in this bonding relationship. And hydrogen bonds are formed when hydrogens, as you would guess, have to be involved. So um, we can look at these positively charged hydrogens that are in this drawing. Now, uh, these are molecules of water. Uh, let me label that. I'll put that down here. Um, or just somewhere here. We're, we're going gonna, gonna to write this. This is water. Here, I'll label it here. Molecules of water. And we know water has the molecular formula that's well known as H2O. So, Here's one water molecule, H2O, and you can probably figure out then by knowing H2O that there's one red circle here that has to be the H, and then, I'm sorry, I just messed that up. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is not H, this is the oxygen. There's one oxygen, but then we have these two silver spheres that represent the hydrogen, so H2 and then O. And one molecule of water will stick to other molecules of water through hydrogen bonding weak attractions. And the reason that this happens is because water is referred to accurately as a polar molecule. So when we look at H2O, there's a polarity about it. Not because we write H2O plus or H2O minus, there, there are no actual like overall net charges with water, but when we look at water's structure, we can say that there are what are called partial charges. So the hydrogens that are, that are situated here, they're sharing electrons with oxygen, but look at how large oxygen is. I'd like you to think of these a little bit like planets. If oxygen is very large, like a giant planet, then we could say oxygen has a lot of pull like say gravity, it's not, this is not a proper description, it's more of an analogy, but if oxygen had a gravity about it, all right, um, the proper term is electronegativity. It's the ability of oxygen to pull electrons towards itself. And that pull, like gravity, will be able to draw the electrons more powerfully towards itself. And hydrogens are smaller by comparison and they're weaker. So they share their electron that they have on offer with oxygen, but oxygen 
is pulling it with more force. Um, if it was a tug of war, oxygen is giant and it has much more ability to pull the electrons. And so what happens is, is there's still a proton in here that makes up hydrogen's structure as well. And that proton, if you recall, has which charge? A plus charge. So we can talk about how this hydrogen also has a proton that gives some positive charge. And these are hanging out a little bit on the periphery. And the electrons that hydrogen has are being pulled in more tightly towards oxygen because of oxygen's electronegativity. So we get what are called partial positive charge characters on this region of an H2O molecule. Look at how it's uneven, by the way. It goes down to one side. It looks like an upside down Mickey Mouse. The face of Mickey Mouse, or the head of Mickey Mouse here. We could say the chin is here and the ears are here. These have partial positive charges. And they're annotated with what looks like a number eight with part of it missing. Or an S with an extra bit of a tail. So here we have this symbol. Here we have this symbol. And actually, we have this symbol up here as well. Let me define that. This, almost like a number eight, equals partial charge. So where are the partial charges located? and why are the partial charges what they are. I described that hydrogen has partial positive charge because the electrons are being pulled in so tightly. But up here, we can talk about pairs of electrons that are unshared. They're just sitting on oxygen's valence, so they're the outermost electrons, and they exist in pairs on the other side here. So um, we can see a couple of unshared pairs of electrons existing here, and we can see another unshared pair of electrons existing here. And recall that electrons have a negative charge, so you have a whole lot of electronegative charge character, partial charge character, as it's referred to, sitting on this side of water. And then the other ones, these arrows, you can actually fill in some electrons there as shared pairs. So we can see there's an electron here and another electron, say, here, and an electron here, and another one here. So we're still talking about H2O being very stable and that it meets the octet rule. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And those valence electrons are very stable, but they're not distributed evenly throughout water's molecular, yeah, throughout water's molecular structure, all right? And so this is really important because remember, opposite charges attract. So if we have one water molecule situated like this, where the ears of the Mickey Mouse head are positively charged floating this way, they can be attracted to the chin area here that has electrons that are unshared and so then we get water molecule, this water molecule sticking here to that one. And because there are two areas with unshared pairs of electrons, then you're gonna get a couple of water molecules that are sticking in that direction on that region of this central water molecule in this drawing. We can see the opposite going on here where the ears that have the partial positive charge are they're gonna be attracted to other neighboring water molecules connected like that. And so when we look at hydrogen bonding within water, we can see that up to four hydrogen bonds could form around a single water molecule. And um, so this brings up um, really interesting properties about how water behaves. And so there'll be more on that in some other slides coming. Realize that when we talk about hydrogen bonding possibilities, hydrogen always has to be involved. That's why it's called a hydrogen bond. But then what is the hydrogen bonding to? So hydrogen is always going to be the source of the electropositive partial charges. Uh, um, you know, where, I was going to say electropositive, just positive partial charges, okay? And it's 
those are those partial positive charges need to be attracted to some sort of um, overall partial negative charge and that's usually going to come from either oxygen or nitrogen in various living systems and biochemical situations so realize that either nitrogen or oxygen could be involved in causing hydrogen bonds to form another really common example if you've had some general chemistry would be that hydrogen bonding can occur in in a solution like ammonia ammonia has a solution of one nitrogen um, bonded to three hydrogens, NH3. And so NH3 can, ammonia can hydrogen bond. Um, you can even have hydrogen bonding when you mix in water into that, um, or you can just have pure water like we're seeing here. Okay, so here are some facts additionally to add to your understanding that you need to memorize about um, hydrogen bonding. So let's take a look. We can say hydrogen bonds may form within the same molecule or between molecules. Now, to clarify, we are not seeing hydrogen bonding forming within a single molecule here. Uh, H2O is too simple for that to happen. Um, please realize, these dotted lines, they denote the hydrogen bond. So those are actual hydrogen bonds, but they're not between the same molecules of water. These are differing molecules of water that make up the hydrogen bonding relationships pictured here. This single H2O molecule has, it, it, it is not showing a hydrogen bond in this picture. What we're seeing here is that H2, H2O is held together by covalent bonds. These particular electron uh, pairs that are shared here, remember pair sharing, that's covalent. So this is a very strong covalent bonding relationship. It's it's very difficult, it takes a lot of energy to break apart water. To break H2O up is not the same thing. You know, we're not seeing H2O forming or breaking in these pictures. We're just seeing um, that the covalent bonds hold together water, but then the covalently bonded H2O water molecules can then be hydrogen bonding to one another. So keep that in mind. Uh, we can also say that um, hydrogen bonding uh, these particular areas are easily broken apart by uh, temperature or maybe changes in pH. And um, we can say that hydrogen bonding is not only important in how water molecules behave, but also amino acid structure and how amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, will start to assemble in such a way that we get functional proteins as well as nucleic acids. So, we're going to learn about DNA and RNA more extensively, and we'll see that hydrogen bonding plays um, a really important role, a vital role in how these things are built so that we are what we are. And that's then referring to the three-dimensional shape. So why do water molecules have a certain property of wanting to feed up in the three-dimensional shape? Why does water expand in when it turns into ice? And that has to do with three-dimensional shape, all associated with hydrogen bonding. The same can be true of how proteins are three-dimensionally globular um, and nucleic acids. They're not just flat. Uh, the hydrogen bonding gives is, is a great influence on three-dimensional shape. Okay. Uh, so just furthermore, um, I, a moment ago I was talking on this last slide about how water expands when it turns into ice and the reason has to do with the hydrogen bonding being locked into place. So when you think, you've probably heard about uh, snowflakes, little crystals of ice that have incredible geometry in such a way that when you look through a microscope or if you've ever seen an individual little ice crystal, it can be beautiful. And those particular geometrical structures come from the hydrogen bond angles being locked into a crystalline shape. So ice crystallizes, and it's due to the fact that the hydrogen bonds are now fixed. Um, interestingly, that causes ice to expand because they take up more space when they're locked into place. Um, when we see hydrogen bonds breaking and forming in a liquid structure, then water ends up taking actually less space. So unlike most solids, usually solids are more dense than their liquid or gas counterparts, water has a different set of rules, and it's due to this hydrogen bonding um, capacity. 
Uh, these water molecules will slip and slide around one another. Uh, they will, the hydrogen bonds can um, absorb a whole lot of energy, so water does not easily heat up or cool down because hydrogen bonds are able to absorb a lot of that or release a lot of that energy without having water uh, change temperatures easily, maybe as other liquids. Um, when water finally does break all of its hydrogen bonds, it becomes a gas. So uh, just like when you've seen water boil on a stove, you have to turn the fire on for a very long time, but once you add enough energy, you finally see the bubbling occurring, you're witnessing this molecular leaks. The picture would be that the individual water molecules are escaping after they've broken away from all hydrogen bonding activity. And of course, if you cool down um, moist air, then condensation can occur and the hydrogen bonding will reform and liquid water droplets will reoccur. So it's all temperature dependent. And there's a question here just asking, why is ice less dense than liquid water? This can be a little bit of a discussion, just recapping what I, I said here. So um, review this slide and then we'll talk about it and write down the concise answer, um, just kind of recapping what I said. Furthermore, we can talk about how hydrogen bonding influences so-called capillary action. Um, capillary action is a phenomenon that we notice when uh, if you were to take like a drinking straw or even smaller, uh, a very narrow, almost like a even narrower than a sippy straw, just a little straw-like uh, tube. And it, the narrower that straw or tube, the more that you'll see water creep up the length of it, just defying gravity. It's really kind of fascinating when you look at capillary action. And when we compare the capillary action where the water can go up quite far in a narrow tube, how is that different than um, when compared to say a wider tube or straw where we see only a little bit of water creep coming up the sides here. So uh, this little area where the water creeps up has a U-shaped curvature to it and you would see it here as well, uh, just not quite as pronounced. And what this is called is the meniscus. And so when we're in laboratory, we always measure to the bottom of the meniscus when we're measuring liquids. Uh, in this case though, we'll just define uh, that it's called the meniscus. So we have that term for, for, the, for future reference. And there's a meniscus in both cases. You, there would be possibly a little meniscus here as well even if it's not as easily seen. Okay. And so the question is, is, well, what causes capillary action to occur in both of these tubes? And also then, why does the narrower tube have greater capillary action where the water travels higher? Now you can guess that it has something to do with hydrogen bonding as the slide is labeled, but I'd like to talk about that. And this is another one of these things where we can do a quick little bit of thinking and thought discussion together during our class Zoom. And so keep that in mind. We'll go back and review this slide. And um, you should be prepared to describe how hydrogen bonding really drives these um, to a greater or lesser extent. Okay, so this is another slide that we can also use for review. Um, I'd like to reserve this as well for the Zoom meeting because what it's doing is, is outlining um, pic with pictures the, all the three bonds we just reviewed, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonding. Um, and so you should be able to look at these diagrams and see which one is which and describe why is it ionic, why is it covalent, etc. Okay, now, if you've had chemistry, I'm sure this will be a flashback for you. I will not spend a lot of time on this, but I wanted to take just a moment to define molarity or what is a mole. And we can say that a mole is a set amount of any given chemical. So water, which we've been on this topic for quite a bit. Let's see, what, what is a mole of water equal? Now, in your chemistry class, your teacher will talk about Avogadro's number something like 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd or some, some wild number. 
Um, and that's how many molecules are in a mole. But we don't ever have to make those calculations in a microbiology setting. But we should be able to have an awareness, always keep in mind, what is the molecular weight? And what do we mean by a mole? Which refer, mole is connected to this idea of molecular weight. So H2O has that molecular formula. Hydrogen has atomic units of one. So if it's H2O, then you have hydrogen having two protons. So that's a total of two times the one atomic unit of weight for each proton. So we get two from that. And then oxygen is, I would say the most common form of oxygen is called oxygen 16 because it has eight protons and eight neutrons. And so oxygen gets a total value of 16 atomic units. And together, if we add up all of that, we get 18. So we say that if you took a scale, and in this case, we can actually measure it, one mole of water can be weighed out on a scale equal to 18 grams. So um, that is a physical amount that we could see and measure conveniently. And so when we talk about molecular weight, it's pretty nice because you can measure moles of a substance um, that you can hold and, and work with in the laboratory that are very precise, and, you, and it directly corresponds to weight. So that's a nice, clean way to understand. And we can also then understand molecular weight um, as we compare moles of one thing to another by just taking these molecular formulas and looking at the number of grams. Uh, that's as far as I want to take that, but keep in mind when we talk, if I say something has a high molecular weight or a heavy molecular weight, then it's going to be a very complex molecular formula that when you add up all the atoms or elements, it's going to be, it's going to be huge. It's going to have a massive number of grams as opposed to water, which is a fairly simple molecule and therefore has a small molecular weight. All right, on to another subject. Well, somewhat. We want to look at the reactions that occur, not just the bonds that can exist between molecules as, as they're built and formed, but reactions are about facilitating bond formation, or maybe the reverse, which is cutting apart and breaking bond formations. And so this is in an effort that all living systems have to utilize in order to gain um, and absorb energy or break those bonds perhaps and release energy like when we eat food and we break it apart and we digest it we get the energy out of that food but then we build ourselves back up hopefully if you have enough energy and enough nutrients then you're going to be bigger and healthier and stronger and so we can talk about breaking apart that food but then absorbing it and rebuilding and so all kinds of chemical energy has to go through biochemical processes when those processes our overall net absorbing energy, we call that endergonic. So endergonic is energy that's input as opposed to exergonic, where then we're seeing an overall net release of energy. And you can define energy in many different ways. We can talk about heat energy like body heat, uh, but we can also talk about chemical energy such as ATP or energy that's in acids or bases and such. So um, we'll see different types of energy. Uh, at this point, um, we're just talking about it in general. There are four different types of chemical reactions. The first one is a synthesis reaction. So our textbook talks about how you could take any molecule or, or atom or ion A and then mix it with B and then you're gonna get AB, however that AB forms. Um, this is a synthesis, you're building A and B together. Um, so what are we saying essentially about synthesis reactions? First of all, some kind of bond is forming. So bonds form in a synthesis. And what else? Keep this in mind, this is I hope really intuitive and that you guys can keep it straight. Don't get mixed up here. Um, when bonds form and A and B are hooked together, that takes energy. It's like building a building. That's the easy way to think about it. You're taking building blocks A and B and you're building something greater. You're building a building and that takes energy. So what's happening? Energy is being put in. And if energy is being put in, what kind of reaction is that? 
energy is being absorbed. That means it's going in. So we're going to use this. We're going to apply this technical term endergonic. Bonds form. Endergonic. Another technical term that you should keep in mind during this learning is anabolism. Anabolism is referring to a synthesis. It's, it's a synthetic process where we're building A and B through anabolism. I remember that technical term according to like anabolic. So if someone says, so-and-so's on anabolic steroids, they're building up their muscles like a bodybuilder or something, um, that's anabolism, that's anabolic. Okay. Moving forward, how about the reverse? What about a situation where you take A and B and now you're gonna break it down into individual components, smaller building blocks A and B come apart. And so if in the previous slide we're saying bonds form, now we're talking about bonds breaking, one or more bonds. So we could say bonds are breaking And so this is the reverse. Also, instead of saying endergonic, we can, by the same opposite reasoning here, say that when you break a bond, which you think of like a stick of dynamite, pow, right? There was all this energy, you light it up, it blows up, and a lot of energy is released explosively. When you break bonds A and B, it's usually because your body is trying to gain energy by breaking something down to keep going. Maybe you're burning some fat, and when you break that fat, those fat molecules, those lipid molecules, then you're gonna get little um, fatty acids that can be broken down further, and those would be like the little molecules that we see here. So we call that an exergonic event. It allows you to keep going when you don't have excess. Very important to understand this process is essential. Every day we go through this, where we eat food, and if you have more than enough, you're building things up, you're building muscle, you're storing energy, maybe you're making some fat, but then in times of need, when you don't have enough food, you don't just drop dead, your body will switch over to an exergonic, um, fat-burning catabolism. That's the other key term. Uh, the opposite of anabolism is catabolism, so that's a breakdown decomposition type reaction. Catabolism may not be as easy to relate. Like I said, anabolic steroids relates to anabolism. Catabolism, I might think of like, if you said a catastrophic event, right? Everything gets blown up. That would be an example, is the bomb hits, energy is released, that's catabolic. Um, maybe that's a good analogy. Anyhow, it helps you to remember and then next we have exchange reactions. And this is actually a combo. So most often, living systems are doing a bit of both at the same time. So you can have a synthesis and a decomposition joining together and you get an, a rearrangement of matter. And we, it's not just a joining, but it's actually breaking one thing apart, breaking something else apart, and then doing a switcheroo. And so we call this uh, exchange reactions. Synthesis plus decomposition. How is this a synthesis and a decomposition? So these are fairly simple molecules. Uh, this is called sodium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide can be mixed with HCl, which is uh, hydrochloric acid. If you've had general chemistry, these are uh, the strongest acids and bases. Uh, you can take a, a solution of this and a solution of that, and as strong as they are, um, this is like stomach acid. It'll, it'll burn you right away. Um, or sodium hydroxide, that can dissolve almost any part of your body over time, you'd have nothing left with these things because they're just so strong on their own. But um, surprisingly, when you measure, 
when you put together, say, an equal amount of hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, they rapidly decompose. You might get a lot of fireworks and bubbling and such, but then what you're left with is harmless water, so that's neutral and friendly, and then sodium chloride. So just look on the left, and we can see that the sodium is breaking away from the OH, which is the hydroxide molecule, and combining with the chloride. And then we can see that the, uh, the hydrogen separates from the chloride, from the hydrochloric acid molecule, and combines with the hydroxide. So you can see that the rearrangement occurs in an exchange reaction. All right, and the fourth type of reaction that we're gonna uh, have to keep track of according to our textbook and just in general with biochem at a basic level are reversible reactions. And this is also extremely common in living systems because our body changes its mind all the time. Living cells go between sometimes needing to put together A and B, but then maybe very quickly if conditions change, going back and saying, well, we need to take A and B and separate them again. And so think about prevailing conditions that might influence such events to occur and to where they would need to be reversible very quickly. Um, so if you, it says here in this diagram, if A and B are combined, it's when there's excess water. So if you have plenty of water and you're hydrated, maybe that facilitates a process where you can make some progress in your body at the cellular level. However, what about under conditions of extreme heat? You could see how these would be opposing to one another. If it's really hot, you're probably losing water. Uh, if you stay hot for long enough, you may lose enough water to become dehydrated. And at that point, you don't wanna just, your body's not gonna just shut down and die. Your body is gonna dig deep. It's gonna figure out ways once the water's gone to try to get water back out, to try to actually take parts of your body that contain moisture and break them apart to try to figure out a way when it's overheated to, to keep going and to not end up just dropping dead. Um, so there are limits, of course, but the reversibility of reactions um, is part of what allows systems to, to go between uh, synthesis, anabolism, and then uh, decomposition and metabolism back and forth according to prevailing conditions. Okay. Um, redox reactions, as we start to drive away from like basic chemistry and atomic structure, and maybe we start to understand quite a bit more towards the biochemical side of it. Uh, the goal of this lecture actually is to get you guys to understand what's happening in living systems. And many of the chemical events in living systems are so-called redox. And this is in reference to the re being part of reduction uh, as a chemical process, and the ox referring to um, oxidation, which is the opposite of a reduction. So. Uh, let's see, coupled, they, they come in pairs. If a reduction occurs, then an oxidation um, will then also occur as a result. Let's see how this works. Um, before I get to the diagram here showing sodium chloride um, forming table salt as a type of redox reaction, so we're seeing ionic bond form um, through a redox reaction, we need to understand what reduction is and what oxidation is, and so we use an acronym that everybody should have heard of if you've had chemistry. And if you haven't, now is your chance to take a little more to you to your first chem class. It's called oil rig. So oil rig, O-I-L-R-I-G, stands for oxidized or Depends on how you want to put it. I'll say oxidation is loss, and then reduction is gain. So here's your acronym O I L R I G. What is lost? What is gain? Let's look at the pictures 
for just a moment. You can see what the, what's going on with the diagrams. Um, if, if you recall from earlier in the lecture, sodium has a, an atomic number of 11. So it has 11 protons that are positively charged. The 11 electrons that it comes with are situated according to the energy shells. Two in the first, eight in the second, so that's 10. Those ener energy shells are fine. You've got the octet rule met in here, but then you've got that one extra 11th lone electron that's gonna want to escape so that sodium can stabilize itself. When sodium loses that extra electron to stabilize itself, what is it doing? So it says, oil rig, oxidation is lost, reduction is gained. So sodium is losing an electron, therefore we're saying sodium undergoes an oxidation. It, we can say the sodium is in an oxidized state in this particular diagram once the chemical reaction occurs, once the electron is lost. So sodium is oxidized. And matter is not created, neither created nor destroyed. We're just simply saying that that electron went somewhere. In this case, the picture shows that chlorine conveniently can gain that one extra electron that it needs to meet its, its outermost valence requirements with the octet rule. So uh, it has 17 electrons. It desperately wants to get that extra electron to make the magic number eight. And so when it does by gaining the electron from sodium, we can say reduction is gained. So therefore, the chloride ion is reduced. So keep in mind, what's being lost? What's being gained? Electrons. If you can follow where the electrons are being lost or gained, then you can understand what's oxidized and what's reduced. And we always have to keep track of that if we're dealing with understanding redox reactions um, or, or redox reactions as a process. Um, and so we'll get back to that. Hold that particular bit of information. We're, we're now gonna shift our focus to organic molecules versus inorganic. Um, organic gets used in everyday uh, marketing. We can talk about organic produce and that's more, more than likely referring to growing vegetables or produce without the use of pesticides. Um, we don't want to add any chemicals like herbicides or pesticides. Um, if we can avoid those, it's probably better on human health. No one knows exactly what pesticides or herbicides may do. The fear is cancer or some other bad result that can happen physiologically. Um, but we're going we're to actually do a simpler version of what organic means. It's a technical definition, but basically we can just say that the technicality is organic compounds qualify as organic, at least in the micro lab, as having both carbon and, and hydrogen um, to qualify. Now, if a compound is inorganic, we can say it doesn't contain both carbon and hydrogen. Um, this definition from your book says typically lacks carbon. An example of an inorganic compound then would be something like H2O, right? So H2O, it, it has hydrogen, but there's no carbon there. And so very much uh, that's an inorganic compound. Um, an example of organic compounds, methane would be like a prime example, right? Natural gas, it has both carbon and four hydrogens, and so therefore, um, that would be organic. Must contain, and I'll underline the word both, that key, carbon and hydrogen. All right, so we've defined organic and inorganic compounds by this simple requirement. Speaking of water being inorganic, a few more words about water. I want you guys to understand um, this close-up version copied and pasted from an earlier slide about the polarity of water. Um, I've already talked about the partial negative and positive charges, but it's important to remember that water as an inorganic compound is arguably the most 
not only the most abundant, but one of the most important molecules in, in every living cell. We can say that the human body by weight is about two thirds water. And that's for a fully grown human adult. If you start talking about like a newborn baby, um, you probably have heard the numbers go up beyond 70% or greater. So maybe closer to three quarters water. Um, and that's true when a baby is born, uh, generally it's kind of in a perfect condition in terms of hydration. And as we mature, uh, our organs hold less water and um, we all have to work to maintain our hydration, but we'll give them a little bit lower approximation of how much we weigh uh, just due to water weight alone. Um, and so water, due to its polarity, its partial positive and negative charges, also acts as an excellent solvent. Um, the partial positive and negative charges are gonna be attracted then to other partial or maybe other positive or negative charges, um, partial or otherwise, that are in the environment that water can then attach itself to and start to break apart. Um, so an example would be salt. So I was mentioning that when you take some salt and you have those crystals of salt and you stir them into a beaker of water or a glass of water, you're gonna find that the salt starts to disappear. So why is that? And if you've never studied this before, it's kind of fascinating, I, I like this particular figure, it explains that if this is your crystal of salt that has this cubical sort of crystalline structure, um, the dark green spheres that are here are going to be separated by water's negative charge. Sodium, which is the dark green, has a positive charge. All the little negatively charged chin areas of like a, a Mickey Mouse head that water has are going to attack, attack. And then we can see that the larger chloride ions, which have a, an overall negative minus one charge, are going to be attacked by the ear positively uh, partial charges that water has. And so water has the ability to attack um, the sodium and the chloride ions aggressively by the polar um, nature that water has. And so we see pretty quickly um, that salt will dissolve in water, um, give it enough stirring and maybe elevate the temperature, it disappears pretty quickly. All right, water also is essential for uh, reactions, biochemical reactions where water is being inserted um, or water is being taken out. So let's look at a, an example here, a hypothetical with water. It says R dash R prime. There's a little dash there, R dash R prime. So, what is that? <laughs> uh, we'll say that this is maltose, based on what the figure is showing. So, maltose is what's referred to as a disaccharide. That means that it has two parts, di meaning two, and saccharide is referring to a sugar molecule. So, Two glucoses hooked together gives us what we call maltose. So R and R prime happen to be the same thing in this hypothetical. Um, and uh, on, on this equation, water participates by the H2O breaking apart so that the H and the OH are separated and they get attached to R and R prime differently. So R gets the hydroxide OH and then this R prime ends up receiving an H from the H2O, but yet what comes out, interestingly, is glucose. Um, and that might be a surprising fact because you're attaching different parts of water. OH is not the same as H, yet what comes out are two identical molecules of glucose. So uh, we have to look more closely at this to understand how water participates. Um, we're gonna look at this with respect to the molecular formula here. So. You're gonna hear me say this many times in both lab and lecture, that the molecular formula for glucose is C6H12O6. And so if you, ha if you do a little bit of addition and you say that one C6H12O6 added to another C6H12O6, um, when you add those two together, these glucose molecules collectively should give us a total of C12H24O12 no big surprise there. However, if you were to look at the molecular formula of maltose, 
rather than just two separate molecules of glucose, the molecular formula ends up being C12, H22, O11. So let's just do the quick subtraction. If you subtract this molecule from that, what is the difference? So the only thing that's different are the hydrogens and the oxygen. We have two less hydrogens in maltose and one less oxygen in maltose. And so the difference is the water itself. And we're going to see this time and again, especially when we look at biochemical experiments in lab. And this is very common um, as a process that we see in biochemistry uh, known as um, a hydrolytic reaction where water can be used to break apart molecules or um, the opposite, which is uh, when water is put into a reaction. Um, sorry, I just messed that up. Um, water can come out of a reaction, like in the case of joining two glucose molecules, and that's a synthesis where uh, condensation occurs. Water actually comes out, just like condensation. You see water appearing out of your environment, but then water can come back in to a reaction to break this apart. Uh, we'll see slides on it, okay? Uh, about uh, hydrolysis versus um, uh, versus a, uh, a synthesis with water. Now, um, we also need to understand pH, guys. Basic chemistry comes into play, especially every day in laboratory. Uh, what is an acid? What is a salt? What is a, oh, sorry. What is an acid? What is a base? What is a salt? So we'll look at these one at a time, and we'll start with acids. If you're not familiar with what pH means, we can say that pH could be thought of as the power of hydrogen. So that P can be thought of as power. It actually means negative log, as we'll see in a couple of slides. But that's mathematically when you're calculating it. Otherwise, let's just think of it, um, it's still accurate in a sense to say power of hydrogen. And the pH is a numerical scale with calculations ranging from uh, zero being the strongest for acidic solutions because any number that's less than seven and the further away from seven you go, below seven, um, the stronger the acid. And, um, and then on the other hand, if you have a number that's greater than seven, we're gonna see um, that that's a base. So, a very common type of acid, by example, would be hydrochloric acid. So HCl, when you dissolve it into water, the hydrogen and the chloride will separate from one another and you get these ionic um, atoms, you know, ions floating around. And what happens is, is whenever hydrogens are released, um, that defines an acid, okay? Acids are, re are substances that release hydrogen into solution Okay. And think about pH as power of hydrogen. So the more hydrogen that's released, the more powerful the acid is. What's counterintuitive for students is that you're seeing that as the number of hydrogen ions goes up and becomes more powerfully acidic, the number goes down. And so mathematically, there's an inverse there that's difficult to, it's easy to make the mistake that you could think the number's going the other direction, but less than seven means acidic um, from according to calculations. We're not gonna do much in the way of calculations in this class, but you still have to understand the numerical values and how they work. Um, substances, on the other hand, that can release hydroxide ions, OH minus in solution, are considered bases. Notice there's no hydrogen ion in this picture. What we're focusing in on are the, the opposite part of water, which is the OH minus. You can have an H plus, as, you know, when H2O breaks apart, but then the other part of it is the OH minus. So if you've never heard the term OH minus, this means hydroxide. Hydroxide has a charge minus, so we can say hydroxide ions. So this is gonna actually cause the pH value to go above seven. And so automatically that will define it as a base or basic solution. 
if um, the pH is going above seven. We can also refer to bases or alkaline solutions as not just alkaline, but basic. So uh, we have the term basic, but we can also use the term alkaline, they mean the same thing when describing pH. Okay, so um, where are we then? How does this affect pH? Remember, pH is referred is uh, defined as a power of hydrogen or a measurement of hydrogen. So when we talk about hydroxide ions having an influence on that, it's the ability of the OH minus ion to attract the oppositely charged positive hydrogen ion, which is then going to remove it out of solution. If you take an OH minus and you combine it with an OH or with an H plus, the H plus and the OH minus are going to combine to make water. And then that's neutral. That's not acidic nor basic. So um, the point is, is that when we talk about hydroxide ions, um, they do have an influence over hydrogen ion concentration, but they reduce the number of hydrogen ions in solution, which is gonna cause the pH value to go above seven. And that's just how we have to memorize um, what bases are and how they influence the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, salts as a related topic, um, they neither increase nor decrease pH, but we wanna keep in mind that you can dump all the salt in that you want as much sodium chloride, break out the salt shaker or scoop as much salt as you want into a beaker of water, dissolve it, and the pH is never gonna change. And that's something that you need to memorize as well. Um, students sometimes make that mistake that somehow dumping in salt changes pH. That is not true. We did say earlier that sodium chloride does um, offer then electrolytes, um, ions that are essential for biochemical reactions, however, we are going to remind ourselves that the pH does not change. At least the salt itself will not change the pH influence wise. Okay, so that's important um, as a note there. Uh, see, we don't see any hydrogen ions, we don't see any hydroxide ions, therefore no change in the pH. Okay, the last slide that we're gonna cover today is just to make sure that that we have sort of on record the facts about pH. Uh, so let's look at these bullet points and call it a day. Uh, pH, we said power of hydrogen. Technically speaking, the little p in physics and chemistry lab actually stands for the negative log function. And that's why we have this opposite numerical value where the greater the value, the less, um, the fewer hydrogen ions. Um, and, and so really the more acidic, the lower the value. And so we're taking the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. And by the way, brackets around whatever you're talking about in chem lab, that's shorthand for concentration. So if I put brackets around something, like say X, what that means is concentration of X. So whatever's inside the brackets, you're talking about the concentration of that item. So brackets around this, concentration of hydrogen ions, and if you take the negative log of that value, you have the numerical pH value. And the pH value is on a scale of zero to 14. So um, seven is neutral, that's right in the middle of seven and 14, but anything above or below that, you start to get into acidic or basic ranges. And it should be kept in mind that the vast majority of organisms really start to suffer or can experience damage if the pH is too low or too high. So there's a narrow band at which most organisms can thrive or perhaps even just survive. And those values are usually between 6.5 and, and 8.5. Um, we can tolerate typically a little more alkalinity, but not too much acidity. Uh, it's true of most organisms. So we say most organisms are what are called neutrophiles. Most organisms are neutrophiles. Neutro meaning neutral. And then phile 
is a suffix that means loving. So neutral, neutral loving organisms. And if you're wondering why, we're gonna get more back to that. We're gonna talk about how there are organisms that are called acidophiles and there are organisms that are called alkalophiles where they can live well below or well above the pHs that are defined here. And in that case, um, that's a different subject. We have to know a lot more about um, proteins and amino acid structure and how pH can influence that. So we'll get back to that topic, um, but those are the basics. And this is a scale that I should. So um, when the time comes and we're discussing our chemistry lecture, uh, we'll work on trying to fill in some of the common items that you might see that are either considered acidic or basic. Um, just to start it off, I'll go ahead and label seven right in the middle. So let's say that, um, let's say seven, what would it be? We could say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. There we go. I think we have all we have room for all the numbers here then. Seven will be right here as neutral. Okay. So this is where we're gonna stop and we'll fill this in together. We're gonna talk about common items, both bodily fluids as well as chemicals that we meet, uh, foods and such that we encounter in our daily lives and where they land on the scale.